Thank you for that, Sarah. I'm looking forward to Sarah's going to be uh, singing at our uh, candlelight service on the 19th and then again at our communion service the very next week and going to give a chance to uh, hear her several more times this month. Excited about that. Uh, we do have some notes for you. Uh, if you haven't picked any notes up, just slip up your hands and uh, there'll be somebody to pass those out. And so I, I like when people call me and they're thinking, um, I can tell when they're, they're in the Word and they're thinking or they're thinking about questions maybe they had never thought about before. And it's kind of like, you know, has anybody ever asked you this or has anybody ever thought this before? And uh, so as we get ready to prepare for Christmas, uh, I want you to think about how special of a time that is, the gift that God gave us in sending His Son but the, how I want to kind of lead into my Christmas messages is saying this, is what about those people who would never hear the gospel? Where do they go? And if they're never going to hear the gospel, then why would God send his son to die? If they're never going to hear the gospel anyway, then why celebrate Christmas? Why celebrate the birth of Christ? Why, why celebrate Easter? Why have the resurrection? Why do any of these things? And so what happens is, is people will start thinking about these questions and they'll call and say, w w how do you respond to this? And I want to tell you, I, I go through and I, I just try to the nth degree, go through the scriptures and try to explain this uh, on, a, on a level that I understand, all right? And so, and I, that I want to understand, that I would want somebody to explain this to me. Because it's a, it's a thought. It's, we we got to move past just our, 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 our thinking that, well, Christ came. But what about, why did he come? And then we have the little placards and stuff that we've hung around our house. He came to die. But if he came to die, and there's going to be a ton of people that's never heard, then why did he come to begin with? And then how are we responsible for that? Are we responsible for that? So if Christ is the person that we must go through to get to God, then what happens when these people have never heard of Jesus Christ? That's the question that I have people that I can tell are starting to dig and they're wanting to know more and they're asking some legitimate questions about their faith, about the justness of God, about the fairness of God. Is God really fair? Is God really just? And is God really righteous with everybody in the world? Because believe it or not, do not compare Christianity to this Western society right here. What we have here in the so-called Bible Belt is not this way all around the world. And if you try to say this is Christianity everywhere else, you, this is not even close to being accurate of what it is in churches in people's lives, Sometimes people are meeting in cell groups, in small places underground to keep from being killed. And they're meeting as much as they can, maybe once a week or maybe once a month. And they're, they're running for their lives. You can't even begin to fathom what Christianity is all around the world. And what people have to do as a relation to their culture. But there's going to be people who have never heard or hear about the name of Jesus Christ. Joshua Project, I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but Joshua Project did a, a survey. Now, there's no way to survey millions and millions of people, but they did it by culture. They did it by the government. They, they did it by uh, where people were located. And 
they did a research on what did it look like about people being reached for the gospel. Now, if you look at the green, it's, it's established or significant people that were reached for the gospel, that the gospel was somewhat present, all right? And it doesn't, it didn't even mean that, you know, it had to be, there was probably some Roman Catholicism in there too and different things or other things, but then you have a formative group where it wasn't quite as reached. Now, I want you to see this because I just came through there. And when I was riding through there this week in Alabama and Georgia, they put them as the formative group of unreached people. And, but the red here, where most of the population resides, is unreached people that have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't often hear about missionaries going to these locations. It's often other, other places. The whole world needs the gospel. But look at the amount of red. The gray is simply unknown. I want you to think about these millions and millions and millions of people who will never hear the name of Christ. And the question that I have for you as you think about it, as we celebrate Christmas so what happens when they die? And so we're going to talk about four questions today. The first one is going to look like this. What happens to the innocent person? I get asked this. The innocent person who has never heard of the name of Christ. What happens to those millions of people in that red category who have never heard the name of Jesus Christ? What happens to them? What happens to the innocent and here's the question, the next question that I would ask you is, are there any innocent people in the world? Because when they define the word innocent, they're saying, meaning never heard the gospel, never heard of the name of Christ, have no idea of his justification, have no idea of his redemption. They didn't sit in Sunday school and children's church and youth group and a service like this. this they've never heard the gospel. So people would classify them as innocent so then i would ask you this if jesus christ came to die then an innocent person would need a savior what was the whole purpose of him coming to die because man was in need of redemption we were in need of being justified before god we had to because we are naturally born sinners and so what i'm saying is this is if man is a naturally born sinner, and they're no longer innocent. But if you claim people that have never heard of Jesus Christ innocent, then they don't need a Savior. Then that means they don't need Jesus, and they're going to heaven by themselves. The Bible says opposite. It says, Romans says, For of all the sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and everybody has sinned. Oh, Everybody. Everybody that's ever been born has sinned. And not only this, the Bible says in Romans 3.10 that there is none righteous, no, not one. Nobody is righteous. Nobody is sinless. Nobody is innocent. Okay? And so I want just to define this word innocent. And that's what I just did. I mean, and we are all with sin. So here's some more questions I want you to think about. So what happens to this guilty person if we're all guilty? What happens to them? The first question I want you to think about as, as I'm, you're really digging into this and I'm making you, I want to pull you out of this seat this morning and I want to make you think. I don't want you to sit here like a blob and go through the service and say, I heard some of it and I don't really pay attention and I got up and left. I want you to think about these questions. Is the guilty man punished for not believing in Christ that he has never heard of? Is that what he's punished for? Just think about it. Is a guilty man punished for not believing in a Christ that he's never heard of? The second question I want to throw at you is God just for sending people to hell because they have never heard of Christ? And a ton of people would say, absolutely not. That's not the God that I serve. We got a righteous, just, merciful God, and he would never do this. I think we could even define this and break this down even further God sending people to hell. We could even break that sentence down even further, couldn't we? Not only this, Ezekiel says this, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather they turn from their ways and live. 
You see, God's will was not for people initially to go to hell. This was not his plan. Hell was not created for you and I. It was created for Satan and his demons. We know this. And so if God is taking no pleasure in the death of the wicked, then why is it that men are going to hell? Why is it that women are going to hell every single day? Here's another question. So should we assume that at this point the only damnable offense is against God is the rejection of His Son? Because oftentimes you do hear preachers preach this and they say, if you reject Jesus Christ, you're going to hell. And that is true. But what if that person has never heard of Jesus Christ before? What if they're part of the millions in the red zone that have never heard of Jesus Christ? So now they're damned for eternity? This is the just God that you serve? Number four is if we think the only damnable offense is the rejection of Christ, then stop preaching. Seriously. Think about it. Would it not be better for you to just stop promoting, don't give any more money to missions, pull all of our mission missionaries off the field, you absolutely don't give a track ever again, we don't preach the gospel in here. We have we read newspaper articles. I tell funny stories. I, I'll pull um, uh, an emotional, really emotional service, get you all stirred up. But we will not preach the gospel anymore. If the only damnable offense to sending somebody to hell is to preach Jesus Christ, I would rather not preach it at all. That way we ensure people are going to heaven, right? So don't preach it. So if that's, if that's what... People, oh, the only damnable offense is the rejection of Jesus Christ, then stop preaching it. That way they don't know. Don't go into the red zone. Don't go into the world. But Matthew tells us different, doesn't he? He says, go, Jesus is speaking here, go, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. So go into all the world. But now Jesus is telling us to go. But if the only damnable offense is preaching the gospel, then aren't we sending people to hell who are rejecting Jesus Christ? So then why do we go? Well, that can't be a fair God either. Here's a fifth question. What if a person was going to hell because of their reject not because of their rejection of God but because of not hearing about his Christ. So what if a person was going to hell because of their rejection of God and not because of hearing about Christ? Understand at this church we do believe in the Trinity and God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are all one and the same. We get that from Genesis 1. In the beginning God is Elohim, the the Elohim, the I am at the end of God is plural. It means three distinct but one God. So understand this when I read this question. I'm not trying to separate them. The Bible says this, that he has made everything appropriate in his time and he has also set eternity in their heart. There's great messages on this and missionaries preaching about this. But I, I just pulled this little clip out right here. I want to show you something. The Bible says that he has set eternity in their heart. Who? Your heart and my heart. Every person in the entire world understands this right here. That we just don't die and that's it. That there is something after death. There is something after this life. Do you know who put that in your heart? God the Father put that in your heart. And if you reject that, that teaching, you've rejected God, you've rejected the conscience of that, you've rejected that. But I want to tell you, everybody is born that there is an eternity somewhere. Even if you have never heard the gospel, you know that there is an eternity, according to the Bible. But Psalms 81.11 says this, but... People do not listen to my voice, and Israel did not obey, so I gave them over to the stubbornness of their heart. What does this look like? Does this look like America today? Does this look like Psalms 8111? It's talking about Israel, but this looks like us. He says, you didn't listen to my voice, so I turned you over. I let you go, and I let you self-destruct. 
So here he's, what he's saying is this. You can reject the idea about there being an eternal God and there's an eternal heaven or eternal hell. He says, and by the way, I'll let you continue to go down that road, but it doesn't deny the fact that there really is one. So people in their heart knows this everywhere, but their stubbornness lets them reject this. So here's the second question. What does mankind have a knowledge of that turns God's wrath against them? So if we have a knowledge of these things, well, then what is it? Now we're going to be in the book of Romans for a little bit. I've been Romans 14. We talked about the freedoms we have in Christ. I told you Romans is a rich book now. In Romans chapter 1, that we see that God is angry at man. God is angry at man. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. God is angry at man. Why? Because they suppress the truth. They're suppressing the truth. Well, the question I have for you is what truth are they suppressing? The existence of God. See, man has a knowledge of God, but they are suppressing the truth of God. They're suppressing the truth of eternity. And now God is angry with them because the day you were born, you were given a knowledge of God. You were given a knowledge that there is an eternity, that there is an eternal hell, there's an eternal, he eternal heaven. Even before you heard the gospel. Romans continues on in 119. He said, for well, what can be known about God is plain. You want to know what the whole world knows about God? Do you want to know what the whole world, this, this in the red zone? Do you want to know what they know about God? Do you want to know if you never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, what you know about God to be true? The Bible says, for what can be known about God is plain to them. Who is them? Everybody. Even to those who what? Suppress the truth. He says, because God has shown it to them for the, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and foolish hearts were darkened. So what is it that the Bible tells us we suppress the truth about God? The people in the red zone, all around the world, the person sitting next to you that may or may not be a believer right now. You don't know that everybody's a Christian in here. You have some people in here that are still trying to figure it out. You have some people in here coming to church that are not believers at all. You have some people that eventually they'll come to know Christ or they may not. But you all know, and I, I know this to be true. I understand even never hearing the gospel about God's invisible attributes. Even though I cannot see God, I can see the hand of God around me. Not only this, I understand His eternal power, He says. We can see how strong and how powerful. You don't have to go very far. You can go to the mountains or you can go and watch a wave at the ocean. You can see a volcano happen and you're seeing the power of God. Not only this, he talks about his divine nature, his Godhead, the nature of his trinity. He says the creation of the world. Science has tried to suppress for years how this world was created. And he says you can look around and know there, there's a God and you are without excuse. And the results of this suppression is this. You are without excuse. You will stand before God and you are without excuse. He says, even though you knew God, you knew about Him. You knew about Him since birth. Nobody had to tell you it was wrong to stick your hand in the cookie jar at the age of three and steal. That's why you looked around before you did it. The Bible calls this general revelation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I already have talked about this in the past. This is a general description of God that God has placed inside of every human being. Not only this, it's to all mankind. He didn't single some out and leave some out. He didn't say, this is just for those who are going to receive me. I'm doing this for all mankind. 
There's a general revelation about God. What we know about general revelation is that God exists and is plain to all mankind. But Chris, aren't there atheist or agnostic? Yes, there's those that claim that. But they weren't born that way. What did they do? They suppressed the truth. Not only this, people know that there is a God, but they're denying His existence. His revelation This is general revelation. His revelation has continued from the creation unto world even to this day. And it will continue until his son's coming. He'll continue to reveal himself around us. Has any of you used the expression this week? I had a God moment. This week. Had a God moment. In the last two weeks, man, I just had a God moment. What does that even mean? You know what it means? I saw the hand of God doing something that only God can do, right? That I saw God doing something that only God himself can possibly do. How many of you have had those moments? And if you've been for a, a Christian for any length of time, you should be like, oh yeah, that was only the hand of God that did that miraculously healed that person, got us through that. We shouldn't be here right now. We should be dead. God did that. He made a way. And so what I'm saying is, when you see these terms, what gave you that indication that that was a God moment? You know what? There's God moments happen around us all the time. To me, every time we take a breath, that's a God moment. To see how our body works and how it functions and how this God has assembled us. To to see how all the creation is working together. That is amazing what God is doing. And his hand is taking care of that every second of the day. Not only this in general revelation, we see God's character is revealed through nature. We can look around and know that there is a God. General revelation also will render man without excuse acknowledging that God is real. Remember, I didn't say that they rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior because there's going to be a ton of people who's never going to hear the gospel. So this is why this is so important to your understanding, to my understanding. Then what are they going to be held accountable for? Some people will say, I can just plead ignorant. Because I've never heard the gospel before, I'm just going to plead ignorance. So some people who never heard of Christ can before say plead ignorance. But can you plead ignorance of God? Can anybody, according to the scripture, in just a few verses that I've shown you th- thus far, will anybody ever stand before God and say, I, I plead ignorance, I didn't know who you were? The answer is no. Everybody will have an eternal knowledge internal knowledge of God in their conscience, in their heart, and the Bible says in their mind all over the world. That doesn't mean they know the gospel. They'll be able to plead ignorance of Jesus Christ, but not of God, not of his nature, not of his eternal power. So this is why people in remote areas, I loved sitting in college classes with guys who had more knowledge in their little finger than I have in my whole mind at this point. But to listen to them talk and explain in our evangelistic classes and our mission classes and and people around the world, and I had one particular man who had visited these particular remote places in some of these uh, countries, and he said one thing that I saw the common thread throughout in everybody's house, it was this, all the gods that they worshipped. And he said, Chris, some of them had hundreds of statues in their house. Who taught them that? What is it that they were doing? They, I mean, why is it that they had hundreds of gods? You see, religious people, they're, they're taking this knowledge of God. There is a God out there somewhere. Look at Romans 1.22. What do they do with this knowledge? See, a lot of people, they're suppressing the truth. I know that there is a God out there. I just don't know his name. And this is what he says. So he says they claim to be wise. And claiming to be wise, 
they became fools and they exchanged the glory of an immortal of God for images. Why is it that they have hundreds of gods that they worship and they bow down to and they bow down? That's why we don't worship a church building. That's why we don't bow down towards a church building or any other building. Because it's an image. It's going to burn down one day. This building is going to be destroyed. And he says they bow down to an image and they worship it. That's why they lay um, um, all over the world for centuries. They have heated up these, their idols' hands and they have put fire underneath them and laid their newborn babies on the fire and sacrificed them to their gods, to their images. And in Romans, he said this is what's going to happen when they suppress the truth. He says resembling mortal man, birds, animals, creeping things. What do people, what do they do? They create. I told you, and, and I think I even showed you the video of the alligator god where I, I saw the missionary video and the, the little girl, they didn't throw little boys in the water. They threw little girls in the water. The firstborn little girl, they threw the little girl in the water and they sacrificed it to the alligator god. Why? Because that was their god. They knew that there was a god out there somewhere, but it must be the alligator god. It must be the moon god. Let's have the sun god. The Egyptians had hundreds of gods. I want you to remember something. Every time there was a plague against Egypt... Every one of those plagues, it wasn't like, man, that was random. God just, you know, threw the locust in there. And then he did, you know, the blood. Every one of them was against their gods. The frogs, the locusts, all those were their gods. And God was going, I am bigger and I am stronger. I am the true God. Every one of the plagues was against their gods. And so because they had made all these different gods, why? Then what does God eventually do with the knowledge that you and I have been given? When you have been given a knowledge of God, and by the way, this is a very, very, very sad verse we're getting ready to read right now. Because what does he do with them? Therefore, when they create these false gods in their life and they don't worship the true God, he says, I will turn them over to the lust of their hearts, impurity, dishonoring their bodies among themselves, exchange the truth of God for a lie, worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. There was a Sunday school class several years ago where the teacher believed in worshiping the creator I mean, worshiping the creation. The parents came outside and these kids were hugging trees. That was, it was, that was creation worship. I did see a shirt this week that I thought was funny. This young man had on a shirt and I kept trying to read it. And it says, if you see me hugging a tree, it's because I am measuring it to see how many boards I can get from it. So people have a knowledge of God, but some people are not going to pursue God. So what I'm talking about, everybody in this red zone, they have a knowledge of God. And what they decide to do with it is totally up to them. But everybody is equally given the knowledge of God. They may not have to understand the gospel, but they have a knowledge of God. So is this type of religion a search? What type of religion? The, the creation worship. Is it really a search for the true God? And the answer, I think, is this. I don't believe pagan religion is viewed as an honest attempt for search for God. But I had a fundamental rejection of God's revelation. I do not believe they're searching for God through an alligator, through a cloud, through a sun, through a moon. But I think it's ultimately a rejection of God. And you know who's manipulating this also? It's Satan himself. Because what's his number one thing? To steal, to kill, and destroy. He is a liar and the father of them. And you know what? If I can convince a people, a generation, to worship these things, guess what? Ultimately, I am having them to reject God. The third question is this, so then how are these pagans judged? How are these pagans judged then when they stand before God 
at the great white throne judgment for those who rejected God. Then we go to Romans chapter 2, verse 14. People are going to be judged by the light that they have inside of them. Yes, it's true that it's a good chance that not everybody is going to hear the gospel and know of Jesus Christ and his, his birth. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 2, For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of law, these having the law are a law in themselves. What, what does all this mean? I'm not trying to get you tongue-tied here or thinking. Here's what it is. Your kid, as I told you, when you stole that cookie as a three-year-old child and you looked around, it's because God had already given the law inside of his heart, inside of your heart, telling you it is right or is wrong. Nobody had to tell you that. He's using your conscience. In verse 15, in that, they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternatively accusing or else defending them. What is he saying? He's saying, yes, every day our conscience is accusing us or defending us in what we should do. Romans chapter 14. And he says, who did this? He said, God the Father did this from the day that you were born. And he says, by the light that you have inside of them. These people that were in the red zone, they will be held accountable for the amount of light that is inside of them and what they know about God. Because it's true, not everybody is going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, every person is responsible for the law that's written on their hearts. So do you think that man always obeys the law that's written on their hearts? No. Can I, can I stop right here? I want you to imagine a world where God did not do this. I want you to think about a society where God did not write any laws on any man's heart to tell them what is right from wrong. Naturally, instinctively, in their conscience. Do you think the shooting at Durham this this Yesterday, day four, shooting in Greensboro and Winston. Kids killing kids on the sidewalk of Chicago to steal their tennis shoe. You think that's something? You wouldn't imagine this world if God had not written the law upon their heart. We couldn't even function. We couldn't go outside of our house. Nothing would be sacred. Nothing would matter. And God did this even as a protection of society. So man doesn't always obey. So what does God call this? He says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. James 4 says it. Of the law that's written upon their heart, what they know to be true about God, that God has naturally placed inside of them. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. How God maneuvers missionaries and reaches people all over the world is an amazing thing. And there's no way that I'm going to tell you to the nth degree how everybody comes to have this saving knowledge all over the world other than this is the first step, is that what they know to be true about God, that they do not reject it. Do not suppress it. So, why will the people who have never heard of Christ be rejected by God? Is it because they have never heard of Christ? Or is it because they rejected God the Father, who has revealed himself, and they have rejected or denied the law of God that's written upon their hearts? Which one is it? Which one is it? Is it because they rejected Jesus Christ and his Son, but what if they never hear about that? Please tell me it's deeper than this. Please tell me there's more. Because if that is the truth, then yes, people could say, I was innocent, so to speak, in my knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Him coming as a newborn baby. People will be rejected by God because God, because they rejected the knowledge of Him that they had inside. And to reject the Father, by the way, is to reject the Son. John says, the one who hates me hates my Father also. The last question is this. So is all of mankind in serious jeopardy? We finish up with Romans chapter 10, 14 and 15. It says this. So how then will they call on him who they've not believed? On how they believe in him whom 
they have never heard. How are they to hear without a preacher? How are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach this good news. And this is what you could argue and say, you know what? It would be better never to preach if this is the rejection of Jesus Christ. Just don't tell them about it. But this is what the scripture says. Oh, it's a beautiful thing to preach the gospel. So what are we doing? What are we doing? We're simply bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to them who already have a knowledge that there is a God. I just don't know his name. I know he's always been there, and I know his attributes. I see his creations. I see his eternalness. I see all of this. I just don't know his name. And why is it that we have fewer and fewer missionaries going out from our churches and fewer pastors going out from our churches? It's because, honestly, I think we just stopped caring. Why is it that money has now pursued uh, the, the culture the American culture where money, 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 if all you can make is money, you're going to have this house and this job and this, all of this. What are we doing? These people already have a knowledge of God. God's already placed this inside of their heart. They understand this in their conscience. There's many of them have not suppressed the truth. He says, so go. And that's not the emphatic there. It's the word teaching, teach all nations. People need to know now how can they be justified just as they never sinned how do they know so how about those who want to find god how about those who have not and i'm and i'm finished how about those who haven't turned over to some type of animal worship or creation worship and they hadn't gone and hugged a tree and that's their worship because if this is all there is left, I'm not saying we shouldn't take care of our environment. I'm not saying that at all. But if this is all there is, we are of all men most miserable. There is more. And, and if you haven't suppressed the truth, and these pagans haven't, these people have in the red zone haven't suppressed the truth and all over the world, Jeremiah 29 says, if you seek me, you will find me. And how are they to find us? How are they to find God? By the feet of those who preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what is this sermon all about? If Christ really came to die, then what is our responsibility? You see, God's already done His part. The recap is everybody knows that God is a true God. But they, dis, they distort or they reject the truth and knowledge about God. There are no innocent people in this world. Nobody will stand before God and say, I didn't know. I had no idea that there was a God. I had no idea that there was, a, there was, that there was internal attributes about you, about your character. I had no idea that this whole world was created by you. He said, nobody will stand before God and say that. And God is going to judge by the amount of knowledge that people have and light inside of them that he has given them. Honestly, I think that kind of helps me with the question about people who are mentally handicapped. What happens to them? By the knowledge and light that's inside of them that God has given them from birth. I'm glad I'm not God. I don't have to worry about that. Go take care of that. Not only this, this gospel, as we think about Christmas, is a redemption gospel for the lost. The pagan people need to re needs Christ to reconcile them to God the Father, and Christ commands us as the church to go and teach all nations. We can celebrate, we can put the plaques up that he was born to die. But if we don't go out and, sh and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who are hungry, that have a knowledge of God inside of them from the time that they were born, what's going to happen to them if they don't hear? That's our responsibility. Let's pray. Father, as we begin thinking about
your son that's come to this earth some 2,000 years ago. As we celebrate this time of Christmas, we think about the greatest gift that's been shared with anyone ever or ever will. But God, let us understand our responsibility in this also. God, we love you. We thank you for the people here who have a desire to see your word spread, to see the gospel spread, to see missions go out. But God, we pray for these people all over the world that have this knowledge of truth and they're begging you to send somebody to them so they can understand, so they can have a knowledge of you, your son, Jesus Christ. We love you and thank you for this precious gift. But God, I thank you for the gift of the preacher who sent it to me and told me about your death and your resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for your attendance today. Don't forget, it's family and friends night. Spend some time with your family and your friends today. Take them out, do something, play a board game, but spend this time with them. You won't ever always get this chance to do this. Um, I'm going to meet with the senior citizens up front right now uh, for those who are going on to the beach trip. And the, oh, uh, so if I can have you guys come on up. And uh, I would appreciate that. I got some information for you.